Well, the market continues to do well and continues to hold on for the mid index along with the frontline indices at near record levels as well. So, good time to get in, you know, a deep dive into the MA landscape in the country. Surabhi Upadhyay, a colleague, is, uh, you know, speaking with Anu Ayengar, who is the global head of advisory and MA from the JP Morgan India Investor Summit sidelines, the venue itself. Surabhi, MA is what everyone's talking about, right? So much paper coming in, so much supply, and everyone's just looking at yep. raising these funds to buy other people. I mean, it's all happening. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, Manglam, you said it. I mean, Deal Street is buzzing in India like never before, I can say. And uh, who else but the big boss lady from Wall Street to give us her view on uh, the way things are shaping up here in India. And, of course, trends around the world. I have with me Anu Ayanga, who is the Global Head of Advisory at M&A at JP Morgan. Anu, pleasure to be here with you in person and thank you for making time. And that's really the big question. I, I, I'll actually start with the India question. Because we're seeing such hectic activity, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less uh, on the M&A side, but a lot in the secondary market on the equity side. How do you find India? How's your day one at the conference and what's the feeling? Yeah, very excited to be here and very mm -hmm. excited to be back here after any year. And the mood continues to be better. Last year when I was here, I thought it was pretty robust. Mm -hmm. And if possible, this year it's even more buoyant <laughs> than it was last year. Mm -hmm. And as you correctly say, the activity in the equity capital markets here have been extremely high. Mm. So the previous high water mark was in 2021. Mm -hmm. And this year already there has been more issuances than the full year of 21. Mm. And so we are very optimistic not just about this year and uh, but also the next year and our pipeline is the best that it has ever been. And there's a lot of drivers for this right because when you step back and look the combination of what is happening domestically in India as well as several multinational companies wanting an acquisition currency in mm -hmm, India. Mm -hmm. So they're using this enhances their ability for future optionality. Mm -hmm. As well as where there is a depth and richness of capital markets this is now an over five trillion valued equity capital market. Yeah. And the growth that you've seen has also been tremendous. Mm -hmm. Even in the M&A market, the previous decade was at about a $70 billion average. This decade has been a $140 billion average. Yeah. And that Double. trend, as you have more companies, more companies investing in India, more companies with an acquisition currency in India, mm -hmm. We really see kind of four different tracks of activity. Okay. One is kind of India for India, mm -hmm. which is driving a lot of consumption. Then there is make in India, so the exports part of it. Right. Then the tremendous inf investment in infrastructure, particularly digital infrastructure. Yes. As well as the fourth piece is all these currencies that are getting created, mm -hmm. as well as domestic activity. Because earlier when we were selling a business, mm -hmm. you were really looking at either the financial sponsor community, sure. which is extremely active in India, mm -hmm. and tremendous amount of money coming into India from mm -hmm. sponsors, is when you look at all of Asia, yeah. the two areas that financial sponsors are putting money into is India and Japan. Uh -huh. In addition to that, for the first time, we also see when we are selling an asset, we have uh -huh. a domestic Indian company yeah. as a buyer for these assets. Uh -huh. Because everybody is looking at the valuation and yeah. saying, I can afford to pay 20 times yeah. or 25 times because I myself trade at 30 times or north of it. You know, I'm so glad you brought up that issue because that's uh, you know wh where we wanted to sort of learn from your vantage point. Mm -hmm. uh, valuations in the listed market, in the unlisted market over here, and as these deals happen, whether it's M&A or, you know, the, mm -hmm. the secondary equity sales, one is always going to be wondering whether this indicates this, this is the peak. And you've seen enough boom and bust cycles, right? Whether yeah. when so-called smart insiders start selling, whether it's private equity or promoters or early sponsors, when they start selling, is it, a, is it reason to be cautious or is it just a sign of a maturing market? Yeah, I think it's... Um it is a sign also of what is the underlying fundamentals mm -hmm. because valuation is related to that mm -hmm. right so what is driving that valuation is as important as where the valuation is yeah. so if it is based on the earnings of the company it's also based on the domestic amount of capital 
through SIPs that is going into oh, the yes. equity market. Yes. So when you look at the inflows, the inflows are actually pretty high. Yes. But then you look at the percentage of domestic household income mm -hmm. that is going into equities. It's still a very small percentage mm -hmm. compared to most of the kind of rich countries or, you know, Western world or whatever you want yeah. to call it. Yeah. As a percentage of how much money goes into the equity market. Right. Right. So as long as the fundamentals continue to be strong, mm -hmm. and as long as you have areas like this, the manufacturing mm -hmm. growth continues to be there, mm -hmm. digital infrastructure continues to grow, yeah. then the fundamentals support the valuation. Okay. So the way that... Um, so you're not sounding too concerned about... Uh, you know how companies are quoting at or how you know the valuations at which deals are happening here in India. No, okay. uh, because currently it is supported by fundamentals. Okay, and All so right. I think that's what we keep watching to uh -huh. say does the underlying fundamentals support the valuation sure. Sure. and then the impact of it is like I said in, in mm. three different categories yeah. emboldening domestic companies mm -hmm. Because when you feel confident about your own stock price, mm -hmm. you act with confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enabling financial sponsors, because the mm -hmm. whole way the financial sponsor trade happens mm -hmm. is you buy something yeah. and you have to have a view on how do I exit. Sure. When sure. you look at the equity markets and your ability to exit, it gives you confidence to yeah. invest. Yeah. And then the third element is the multinational companies creating a currency right. by taking their Indian business and listing it. Fair point. And now let's add the, the global backdrop to all of this because we speak when the rate cutting cycle has finally kicked off yeah. in the US. There's also politics. So just let's start with what lower rates are in general going to mean for the overall global m and landscape and for emerging markets like India or, or Asia. What do you see right. there? So I think the uh, expectation of the Fed rate cut was fairly well telegraphed mm -hmm. and the market had built uh, that into it. There is further expectation as well, which also the market is, uh, has built in. So that's generally healthy because that means you feel better about inflation and that's what, what makes the Fed confident to do that. So um, the cost of doing deals becomes lower, mm -hmm. which should enable more deal activity in theory, right? Sure. So financing was always available, but the cost of that financing has gone yeah. a little bit better. Yeah. And if, when you look particularly at the overall uh, global M&A market, strategic activity is back to 90% of historical averages. Okay. Sponsor activity, which is much more influenced by the interest rates, is at 60% of historical levels. So all the pent-up activity from the sponsor side, mm -hmm. if that comes back online in 25 and 26, that mm -hmm. should prove very valuable. That's mm -hmm. not been the case here in India, yeah. but more globally, sponsor activity has been more limited. So now we have to cover two more interesting subjects. Sure. Uh, one is obviously AI and this yes. huge disruption that's playing out across the world. What do you think it will mean in terms of uh, you know, deal activity or issuances uh, for not just the world, but markets like, uh, like India? So I am very excited about the possibilities of AI, both as a personal user <laughs> as well as the possibilities it has for our business <laughs> and the possibilities it has for our clients. So this morning we had a wonderful presentation by the Union Minister on everything that is mm -hmm. happening uh, in, in India and the outlook kind of for the next 10 years, the 2030 plan. And so AI I think has a pretty big role to play because if you are going to manufacture more and have exports that is being forecasted, this could be a game changer. Right now, the number one topic that boards in global companies are talking about yeah. is the impact that AI is going to have on their own businesses. Mm -hmm. We ourselves are testing several LLM suites, about mm -hmm. 400 different ones in our investment banking business, to try and see how it is that we can use that. Because the data is vast. Uh -huh. The organization of the data is very limited. So if you can organize the data and draw conclusions from it, that can be powerful Sure. in terms of providing insights. So the, the other hot subject that we must get your view on is obviously US elections, right? Yes. So uh, while the debates will continue and you know uh, the uh, estimates will keep swinging, uh, 
what impact? I mean, does it really, will it dramatically have any meaningful impact, irrespective of the outcome, whether it's Republican yeah. or Democrat? So usually... For, for markets and in general, you know. Yeah, so usually yeah. in um, election year, yeah. there is not dramatically reduced or increased activity. There mm -hmm. are, you know, idiosyncrasies yeah. when there is an expectation of some tax change one way or the other. But the overall M&A volumes in an election year it's kind of in line with other years, mm -hmm. right? So there's not a there's not a material change. Places where you could have change are the biggest debated areas mm -hmm. are antitrust, okay. because the antitrust and regulatory framework and the unpredictability of it has been one of the impediments to deal making. Okay. And so that is an open question in terms of you know is, is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? Sure. sure. And it's not even whether it's restrictive or expansionary. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just can you predict it? Sure. Right? Do you have a good sense of it? Got it. So last question, and we only have 30 seconds left on the conversation, but yes. if I were to ask you to take a crystal ball and look forward into the next 12 to 15 months, mm -hmm. talk about uh, secondary market activity or M&A deals in general uh, in Asia and in India in particular, what would you say would be the hottest sectors? So I view in Asia as India to be the brightest spot uh, within Asia and uh, Japan to be the other uh, kind of country. And so we are very heavily invested and, uh, and rooting for it. And sectors wise, I'd say digital infrastructure, energy transition, uh, as well as uh, multinational companies uh, monetizing. All right, we'll watch it for those trends. Thank you very much for joining in and giving us it's my perspective pleasure. on all of these issues. Thanks very much. On that note, we need to take a very quick break. Back in just a moment.